go? <laughs> okay, good to go. <laughs> Super. Okay, guys, so today we're going to be talking about pulmonary rehab. It's a pretty broad topic, and um, I decided to kind of narrow the scope and focus more on COPD for the purpose of this talk. I have no disclosures. Video, this is not working. Hmm. What did Rodeo go? Never mind, I got it. Were you about to come up here? Okay, guys, so the outline of the talk was going to be about the definition, the historical background. Um, the physiological rationale for COPD, program components, outcomes in COPD. I'm going to briefly touch about pulmonary rehab and interstitial lung disease and pulmonary hypertension. What's going on? And outcomes and other chronic respiratory diseases as per the ATS criteria, and then barriers for pulmonary rehab in our patients. So, why do we need pulmonary rehab? Why is pulmonary rehab? So important. It's an, op it's an open question. Oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a comprehensive intervention based on policy. <laughs> <laughs> You're giving me the definition. But why, why is it important? Why is it important in our patient population? <laughs> why is it important? For every patient? Or? For our COPD patients. Oh, I was my talk that you guys canceled for me because of the mouth speaker. So I it has been shown to decrease uh, pre-hospitalization and exacerbation rates and I think more compliance. Okay, that's a pretty good answer. It has a head relation with the uh, depression, decrease the patient mm -hmm. depression. Mm -hmm. That's good. Anything else? <laughs> Anxiety. Okay. So, I mean, you know, you guys are right. I mean, what do, what do we know about COPD? We know that it has a high incidence of morbidity and mortality. Um, a lot of healthcare dollars are spent treating this disease. We know it's the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. We know it's responsible for over 13% of hospitalizations in the U.S. Um, and we know the biggest trouble problem that a lot of people have who have COPD complain about is exercise intolerance, okay? And with this exercise intolerance, they're short of breath, they have leg fatigue, they're tired, um, and unfortunately, they start to limit themselves on what they can do. And they have problems with just regular everyday tasks, so getting to work, um, getting up to take a shower, getting down the stairs to make breakfast is, is difficult for them. And, Unfortunately, um, it progresses to deconditioning, and that deconditioning is related to issues with functional status and unfortunately mortality. So the American Thoracic Society and European Society in 2013 put out a definition of what exactly pulmonary rehab is. And basically, as it says, it's a comprehensive intervention based on a thorough patient assessment followed by patient-tailored therapies that include, but are not limited to, exercise training, education, and behavior change, designed to improve the physical and psychological condition of people with chronic respiratory disease, and to promote long-term adherence to health-enhancing behaviors. So pulmonary rehab can be initiated at any stage of the disease during periods of clinical stability or during or directly after an exacerbation. And the goals are multiple. You want to minimize symptom burden, maximize exercise performance, promote autonomy, increase participation in everyday activities, you want to enhance their quality of life, and you also want to affect long-term enhancing behavioral change. So when we talk about pulmonary rehab, you know, it's an idea that took many decades to really catch on nationwide. And the person that's considered to be the grandfather of pulmonary rehab is Dr. Alvin Barak. So he was a pioneer in his own right, he was a pulmonologist on faculty at Columbia University and NYU, and he was a very prolific author. In fact, he had written over hundreds of papers, and even in 1977, the year of his death, he actually ended up publishing six papers. Um, a lot of the studies that he did was really based on the use of oxygen 
And this is just a picture of him in 1926 in one of the original models of what an oxygen tank was looking like. But he was a guy that was ahead of his time, and he really believed in pulmonary rehab way before other people got on board with it. In a paper that he wrote in 1952, he said, in two patients with pulmonary emphysema, in whom dyspnea on exertion was relieved during inhalation of oxygen, an exercise program was instituted with subsequent marked improvement of capacity to exercise without oxygen. The progressive improvement in the ability to walk without dyspnea suggested that a physiological process similar to a training program in athletes may have been produced. And then a decade later, he wrote, when I see a patient then whose pulse on walking back and forth two or three times in the hallways in my office increases to 140, it is evident that he hasn't walked enough to maintain cardiovascular efficiency. It may seem unusual, perhaps, to suggest exercise to these breathless people, but in fact, it is one of the ways by which they can restore physical fitness. So if he's considered the grandfather, Dr. Thomas Petty out at the University of Colorado is considered the father of modern pulmonary rehab. Um, within himself, he's a pretty much a pulmonary pioneer. He basically established a scientific basis for long-term oxygen therapy and also coined and described what was first known as ARDS. But he established one of the first standardized outpatient programs for pulmonary rehab. And in 1969, he published a landmark paper, a comprehensive care program for chronic airway obstruction. So you have all this, these men in the 50s and the 60s and even the 70s that were promoting pulmonary rehab, but you still had this lull that happened in the 1980s and the early 90s. And a lot of it had to do with this paper that was put out by Bellman et al. in 1981 that was really influential in discouraging pulmonary rehab. They looked at patients who went through an exercise training program and tried to delineate if there was any changes in skeletal muscle enzymes in these patients. And in their analysis, they felt that there was no improvement in lung function or muscle function and that they couldn't find any biochemical markers that really made a difference. So a lot of people were very critical of this letter, mainly because they felt that the exercise intensity that they used in their program was too low to expect any biochemical changes. But nevertheless, this made a very influential paper that influenced a lot of people's thought process about not using pulmonary rehab in their patients. So we really don't see the resurgence of pulmonary rehab until the 1990s, late 1990s. The ATS comes together and they bring a group of experts to finally um, put out the science really behind the use of encouraging pulmonary rehab. So let's transition over to what's the physiological rationale for using pulmonary rehab, especially in our COPD patients. So quick question to the group. Pulmonary rehab improves all of the following except which factor? Why? <clears throat> It's physiologic. Dyspnea is a perception. Okay. Quality of life. Of course, if you're not dyspneic, your quality of life is better. Okay. And if your conditioning, cardiovascular conditioning improves, your six minute walk would improve. So, by process of elimination, C is the exception. So, what does pulmonary rehab do for FEV1? Nothing. I heard a nothing. I heard a nothing. Something. Something. Okay. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> Something sometimes. This is a paper that was uh, published not too long ago that actually looks at the evolution of FE1 decline in patients with COPD. So you write. FEV1 is, is not improved by pulmonary rehab, but it actually does slow the decline in your FEV1 function. This is looking at a group of COPD patients over a three-year period. The triangles are those in the interventional group that received an exercise program. The control were just patients that were on pharmacological agents. So there's a lot of data about COPD. Sorry, on that. The, your, the PFT difference, I mean, one of the things you pointed out is that pulmonary rehab improves compliance with other therapies. Is there any, do you know whether the compliance with their inhaled therapies for these two groups were the same? 
They didn't measure that and didn't discuss that in this particular paper, unfortunately. What we, what we know, well, we'll get to another paper later. There's a, there's a, I think there's an, another slide that's going to address that point, I think, later in the talk. So there's a lot of literature out there that talks about looking at COPD, not just as a localized disease that's happening in the lung, at the airways, at the lung parenchyma, but it's actually looking at it as a systemic disease that affects other target organs downstream. In this particular article by um, Dr. Wooters et al., which is a pulmonologist out in the Netherlands, he looked at body cell mass wasting, muscle wasting, and then also changes in muscle metabolism in patients that have COPD. <clears throat> and the concept that is, is really pushed forth, or the theory that's really pushed forth, is that we know that at the site of the lung, you have oxidative stress. We know that you have an upregulation of inflammatory markers like um, interleukins and TNF alpha that spill over into the peripheral circulation, and then later downstream can affect a lot of different target organs, in particular skeletal muscle. And so the idea is that the spillover effect is responsible for a lot of comorbidities that you see with COPD. So in particular, a lot of people have focused on skeletal muscle dysfunction in COPD. And so we're looking at factors that influence this. And unfortunately, the black doesn't come up as well as it should. But basically, we know that malnutrition, hypoxia and hycarbia, systemic inflammation and deconditioning all play a role in making your patient feel pretty much dyspneic. And then we also know at a cellular, cellular level, rather, what's happening is we have a change in your type 1 muscle fibers to type 2. And that comes into play at the biochemical level simply because type 1 fibers are responsible for oxidative processes that increase your ATP and therefore increase energy. If you have a switch over to type 2, then you have more of a glycolytic process happening, which is less energy efficient. That in turn leads to decreased capillary density, mitochondrial oxidative enzyme function is compromised, earlier onset of anaerobic metabolism, lactic acid's going up, pco 2s going up, and that too makes your patient feel very dyspneic. And then in particular, when looking at the level of the mitochondria, a lot of people have focused on um, this key enzyme called citrate synthase in the Krebs cycle that's responsible for the metabolism of oxygen. So in this study published in Thoracic in 2000, one of the things that they wanted to look at was the activity of citrate synthase in patients um, that have muscle biopsies. Mm -hmm. Most of the patients had them, well, actually all of the patients had their muscle biopsies taken from the vatus lateris muscle, which is the outer thigh muscle. And what they were basically able to show is that a lot of these patients that were normal had a pretty normal level of citrate synthase, but in the patients that had COPD, the citrate synthase levels were actually decreased. And then they decided to break up their COPD patients in functional class. So they established four functional classes based on what their exercise <laughs> capacity was on the exercise <laughs> test. So they put everybody on a bicycle, they put an A-line in them, and they broke them up based on what your peak VO2 max was. So if your VO2 was at 20 milliliters per kg per minute, then you were considered to be in class one or functional class A, which basically means that you had no impairment. If you were between 16 and 20, you were in class P, which is basically mild impairment. If you were in class C, you were between 10 and 16, which is moderate impairment. And then if you were in class D, you were less than 10, which is considered very severe impairment. And we see, as expected, that if you are in class A or functional class one, your citrate synthase levels at our, are much higher than compared to somebody that's in functional class four. And then they also were able to prove what happens with your enzyme levels pre and post rehab, and you see there's an improvement. So other pulmonologists have looked at other factors. You have Richard Kasseber and Wasserman that looked at lactic acid and ventilation, and they found that with exercise, there was an improvement in both. So let's talk about the program components inside of pulmonary rehab. <clears throat> 
So we're working three major muscle groups. We're talking upper, we're talking lower, and we're talking ventilatory muscles. Those are the major focuses that we're working on. So when we talk about lower muscle endurance, uh, the exercise prescription plan usually consists of either a bike or a treadmill. So we usually start people on the bike um, with a speed corresponding to 50 to 85 percent of their VO2 max based on their initial exercise task or 80 percent of the speed walked on the initial six-minute walk. And then you put them there for 10 or more intervals. Once the patient is able to walk continuously for 20 minutes, the speed is increased by 10 percent. And then once that patient is able to walk for about two miles, then the incline is at it. For the bicycle, it's a very similar concept, 50 to 85 percent of the VO2 max, or 25 percent of the maximum achieved on that exercise test for 10 or more minutes, and then we move to 60 percent within two weeks. And then once that patient is able to do 15 minutes, then the exercise resistance is increased in increments of 5 to 10 watts. So the question is, which is better? When you go to the gym, which is better? High intensity exercise, a low intensity exercise. You're trying to improve exercise tolerance. High. high is better? Low, high. Low, is better. Low, is better. low is better. High is better. Which is better, guys? High. Medium. Moderate to high. Okay. So this is actually the source of a lot of debate, actually, in the literature. Some people will say high. Some people will say low. And it's really about are you trying to improve training versus long-term compliance. Now, there are some studies that say if you put somebody at a high intensity of 60 to 75 percent of their maximal oxygen uptake for 20 to 30 minutes, at least two to three times per week, you're definitely going to ensure endurance. So this is an article in Chess that was published in 2005 that looked at skeletal muscle adaptations to interval training in patients with advanced COPD. So they looked at very high intensity intervals versus moderate to high intensity intervals. And they took 19 patients with advanced COPD, randomized them to the two separate groups, and they put them in a 10-week program with follow-up muscle biopsies. Interestingly enough, we find that whether you're doing very, very high intensity or you're doing something that's moderate with constant load, the oxidative enzyme content improves in both groups, which I thought was pretty interesting. But if you are in a very, very high intensity group, those patients were less dysnic and they also had less uh, leg discomfort. What about upper extremity training? Appreciate that shout out. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about upper ext extremity training. So. Different, different tests you're talking about using unsupported weightlifting, therabands, um, arm ergometry. Um, what I thought was a really interesting study is they talked about arm exercise and hyperinflation in patients with COPD. What's the effect of arm training? And this was a study published in Chess in 2005. What's the, the physiological changes that happens when you take a patient that has moderate to severe COPD and they're raising their arm? What's happening with their lung volumes? What are you increasing? So there's a change in the length tension relationship. Okay, what else? So you said this, Rodeo. <laughs> you brought your arm up. <laughs> What does this represent? Uh, more rib space. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the concept of, of dynamic hyperinflation is if you take somebody with merit severe COPD and they raise their arm, you're going to have an increase in their functional residual capacity, which is fine when you're starting to um, have issues with ventilation because what it does is it minimizes your expiratory flow limitation. That's fine. The problem is, is that it starts to cause problems with your muscles of inspiration. It starts to add on an increased workload. And so it starts to diminish your inspiratory capacity. And your patients start to feel the sense of increased effort and increased breathlessness. Okay. 
So they took 12 patients that meet that criteria. They put them through six weeks of arm training. And they looked at the arm exercise capacity, dynamic hyperinflation, and dyspnea <laughs> before and after training. Cool. That's just the long changes we were talking about. And what they actually found that patients that went through this exercise program had a better preservation of the inspiratory capacity during arm exercise after training. And they found that it decreased the work effort, decreased their level of dyspnea, and then finally decreased their <coughs> dynamic hyperinflation. So exercise prescription would include um, using the upper body ergometer starting around four minutes, and you start to increase the resistance with the goal of getting them to 15 minutes of continuous training. And then you do resistance training with weights, and you start to increase repetitions and, and sets and um, weight size. What about inspiratory muscle training? So we talked about upper, we talked about lower. What about actually doing something to focus on the muscles that are involved in inspiration? So the data for this is, is conflicting and controversial, and I, I think I spoke to Cheryl, who's our nurse program coordinator, and I don't think we actually offer this here um, at our athletic center on the boulevard. But the rationale is that you have all these geometric changes happening in the thorax and the diaphragm, and ideally, if you can strengthen, almost give kind of like weight dumbbells for your diaphragm, you can really help these patients to power breathe. And so this is a study done by Beckerman et al. in Chasta 2005, and they looked at the effects of one year of doing inspiratory muscle training in patients with COPD. So they took 42 patients with an FEV1 less than 50%, and they randomized them to INT versus sham, which is basically anything without any load. And they found that with these particular patients, there was an improvement with functional status, and there's also an improvement with uh, dyspnea. They also found, interestingly enough, there's a decrease in hospitalization in those patients that receive muscle training. Uh, so another technique that some people talk about is breathe, breathing retraining, where you, yeah, go back. Can you describe a little bit what inspiratory muscle training is? And what, what would you have the patient do? So you're using a device kind of similar to a, um, yeah, kind of like an effective spirometer that has some weight or resistance to it at the bottom. And what you're doing is when you take a, like our IS 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 <coughs> at the spirometer, and you're taking a deep breath in, if you're doing it without any weight or resistance to it, that's a sham. There's no load on it. But at the bottom, if you put a heavy, some type of weight onto it, when you're trying to take a deep breath in, you're doing it against weight, you're doing it against resistance. The idea is that you're building up your diaphragm muscles. And is that is that like other training? Is that being done where they're increasing the weight every yeah. day? And yeah, I think I. So they do two 15-minute training sessions twice a day for 12 months. In this particular study, they began at 15%, increased by five to 10% each session until you reach 60% by the end of the first month and then training is continued at 60%. So that's a, tech, that's a technique they used in their study. I know Cheryl said we don't offer that here, and I'm not sure what the protocol would be at other programs across the country. And yeah. if you yeah. this for the board, it's the wrong answer. There are three MCQs about this. Every mm -hmm. time you take an inspiratory muscle, it's not part of it, so it's wrong. Don't take it. <laughs> Upper extremity high intensity, that's the answer. I'm sorry, did I, did I answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. But it goes for quite a month, so they do something like 12 months over there? Yeah, it sounds like it's a 12 month program. Oh, see, it's like a few months and then you graduate. So, <laughs> other components of, of pulmonary rehab, you have the educational topics where patients are just taught about the anatomy and the benefits and oxygen therapy and medication management and then of course diet and nutrition which is very important then you have the psychosocial behavioral components where you really work on patients with their anxiety and their depression and they have group sessions where they can talk about <coughs> coping skills 
And so because we know COPD is just a vicious cycle with all these factors into play, pulmonary rehab has just been really, really beneficial. So let's talk about the outcomes of pulmonary rehab. And this is just a very brief few slides. So Gross et al. and Lancet in 2000 talked about the effects of pulmonary rehab in their COPD patients. And so they found that one year, significant sustainable improvements happened with exercise tolerance, respiratory symptoms, depression, and quality of life. Interestingly enough, the data for deaths and hospitalizations was found to be not of statistical value, but the data for admissions and hospital days slightly were. What about pulmonary rehab and ILD and pulmonary hypertension? So Collard et al. in CHESS in 2009 um, found that there were improvements in also the Borg scale and the six-minute walk distance. And he looked at which patients would benefit most from IPF. And these are different authors that factored in different things that they felt, or rather that they identified in IPF patients that would benefit from pulmonary rehab. You know, there was an article that I read that I didn't put up here and I meant to um, that talked about they weren't super impressed with the exercise tolerance that uh, ILD patients received, in particular IPF, because they felt that the benefit was very short term and that with a year program, maybe about the first six months, these patients did well. And then after that, there was some deterioration. What about exercise and pulmonary hypertension? So this is a, a study done by Chan et al. in CHAST in February 2013 that looked at group one pulmonary hypertension patients. Um, they had to walk less than 400 meters, but more than 50. They put them on 24 to 30 supervised sessions of treadmill walking over a period of 10 weeks. And they initially screened about 300 patients, but a lot, for whatever reason, got excluded. And I have those reasons listed. So they only end up randomizing 26 patients. Group one was allocated to exercise and education, and then group two was allocated to just education alone. And what they actually found was that patients that were in group one, that's the black bars, that got education and exercise, they had a greater improvement in their six minute walk compared to group two, which is the gray bars, that only received education. And they also found really no improvement in the education group alone and no adverse events were really noted. So what do we tell our pulmonary hypertension patients about exercise? It's probably not harmful, likely very helpful, but they really should talk to their pulmonary hypertension specialist or MD before starting a program. They should not over-exercise. Light resistance training and moderate aerobic activity are recommended. Use a recovery time of five to 10 minutes and avoid activity and extreme temperatures, like extreme heat or extreme cold. And once again, when they start exercising, they should really be in a supervised program. So what about other lung diseases? Um, I really just pulled off the slides from the ATS consensus statement of 2013. And they broke down the different subpopulations of lung disease. And they talked about the evidence, the outcomes, the special considerations and then specific assessment tools. So I just threw this up here for you all to have as a reference to review a little later at your leisure. But they went over ILD, bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, asthma, pH, lung cancer, and um, lung volume reduction surgery, and then lung transplant. So in the metro Detroit area, what are the barriers for pulmonary rehab? Insurance. Okay. Access transportation. What else? Not enough centers, sure. And then the few centers that we have, like Saeed said, sometimes they're backlogged in trying to get patients in there. So you know, this is a study done by um, Hayton et al. back in 2012 that looked at 700 COPD patients referred to rehab, and they were really trying to understand what are the reasons for poor attendance and poor adherence. And so they looked at for poor attendance, oxygen use, and living alone, and then poor adherence, reasons where they were still smoking, poor shuttle test walking distance, hospitalizations because they were having exacerbations, and then poorly perceived health status. So how do we fix this? We as physicians, we send somebody to pulmonary rehab, there's a barrier there. How do we address this? <laughs> 
Don't vote for Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to the case manager. Talk to the case manager. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenging thing to try and fix because a lot of those things are more of the social part of medicine and, and not a part of the basic science. But the um, group of researchers that looked at this are out of Australia, actually. And they looked at barriers to referral, and then they looked at ways to facilitate the referral to pulmonary rehab. Um, and a lot of it had to do with trying to get people to buy into it, not only our patients, but also our providers um, and different factors. So it's, it's an ongoing issue that you know, needs, to be, needs to be addressed. So those are references. Uh, this is two quotes that I found really liked from Dr. Barak. Remember to cure the patient as well as the disease. And an alcoholic has been lightly divined as a man who drinks more than his own doctor. <laughs> and as always, it's better in the bombs. That's it. Thank you.